Welcome back to BeccaStar.com. I'm Becca Starr and today we are talking about toxic siblings. You can have toxicity in so many different relationships. Usually those relationships that are closest to you, maybe where there's some dependency, there's an imbalance maybe of even the give and the take in the dynamic of a relationship. It could be a boss at your job or a business partner, like you're really dependent on them for your livelihood. You need things to go well, but they have these behaviors that are quite harmful. Now we're heading into the holidays. Next week is Thanksgiving, and then we have Christmas. And if you have any more than usual time coming up, we're going to have to be with family and you have some nerves around it and you just know. You have a very intense sibling, you would probably describe them as toxic and you just deal with it year after year, I am here to tell you, you have some options. Now, one of the worst things is feeling trapped in the situation, feeling trapped in that relationship, feeling like you have to play a certain role just to kind of, kind of keep things even keel so you don't upset anyone too much. And it could be that sibling, you don't want to upset them. Maybe they're very reactive or Maybe your parents or your mother or somebody in the scene that has to do with the family dynamic. Maybe your grandmother. Maybe you just don't want to upset people for kind of drawing a line in the sand. Like, this is not okay. This has never been okay, but this is where I draw the line. Now, I'm very familiar with toxicity in families, and I've had to make some decisions myself. It was a long road and I think that it's never gonna be easy. They are your family. And sometimes you just have to make hard decisions, but I'm going to describe to you what to look for, for red flags, and what really identifies someone's behavior as being toxic and quite harmful. That's the thing, is this isn't just somebody that's entitled or selfish or, um, maybe have some sibling rivalry, like all of that, it's pretty normal. The level of dysfunction can vary. It's not pleasant. Nobody wants to deal with that kind of stuff, but it's just more challenging than it is harmful. And that's really the distinction we're going to make. And if you have a toxic sibling, I'm going to tell you how you can deal with that as we go into these holidays and at any time of the year. And also you can take these um, new skills and apply them if you do have a boss or someone else in your life. It really starts with your self-esteem and it's how you truly value taking care of yourself because when you're having to deal with these toxic people, you are putting their needs first over and over again, which in some situations, maybe that's not a terrible thing. But when you're doing that over and over and over again, and it's causing you harm, and you're allowing that to happen, that means that you're really part responsible for all of the, the pain and all of the toxicity. You are 50% responsible, and of your 50%, you are 100% responsible for the choices you make. And after you watch this, and there's a corresponding article that I've written, and if you could read the article and you really let this sink in and you absorb it, hopefully you go into these situations just with a slightly different perspective and you're able to see things in a way that serves you better, serves your self-care better. It's one of these ways that we can reparent ourselves. When you need to reparent yourself, that means you're the loving, stable, sometimes firm, always consistent and committed to your well-being. You're giving that to yourself. And so this is just one of those ways that you can really reparent yourself build your self-worth and your self-esteem, and hopefully, eventually, find that other relationships in your life are also improved because this is affecting, if you have a toxic sibling, it actually does have an effect on probably many other areas in your life, whether that's because you're complaining about it, you're talking about it, you're allowing behaviors 
that maybe you wouldn't even allow anyone else to ever behave or treat you this way. But you're letting your sibling do it because they're blood or because they're your family and you're just supposed to accept them. That isn't okay in any relationship, including a relative. Now, when you have a sibling, sometimes there's a feeling of commitment to their well-being. You grew up with them. You do love them. There is a part of you that really, truly cares for them and wants to be there for them and have them in your life. Even as you know, intense as it can be to be around them, maybe it's exhausting to be around them, but you want to have them in your life. Like you have this idea of what a sibling means to you and that's a valuable role in your life. And so you're willing to just keep things steady so that you can continue to enjoy that. And that's perfectly fine. In that, I'm gonna show you ways in which you can start to take care of yourself more. So this conversation, the article that we're gonna link this to, it doesn't have as much to do with your sibling as you think it might. It has to do with you, how you feel, what you're willing to tolerate, what you're willing to stand up for or create in, for your own life. This is all about you, my friend. This has nothing to do with the toxic sibling that we thought we were going to talk about. So what I want to do is just give you some ideas of what are things to look for in somebody. It could be any person in your life. And again, today we're talking about siblings, but you can use this in any area of your life. It really helps you to start to identify behaviors and make choices. Do you want this in your life or do you not want such negativity that will have an effect on all other areas of your life? Do you want to make the choices now given new information? So I'll give you some red flags and these are things to look for in someone's behavior. And I also just want to explain, I am in a Hilton right now in the business center. Um, we are on the road with my husband and it's awesome. He just gave me some time to myself. So I have this on my heart to do this video for you. It was kind of in my things to do this week and it's already, I think it's Friday night, Saturday. It's Friday night, it is. So it's the Friday before Thanksgiving and it's a great time to be talking about this. We're going into all these different scenarios and I want you to be fully prepared and just know it doesn't have to change this season, but you're planting seeds for yourself to have some more options. And when you're in such a toxic dynamic and it can definitely affect the whole family, it really makes you feel trapped and, and it's just this thing that really repeats itself. Their crazy behavior makes everybody else kind of make it okay, act as if everything's fine, and ultimately enable crazy behavior. And if there's consequences or not, there's really no, there's no end in sight. There's no solution based, you know, conversations. It's it's really just a vicious cycle that continues on and on and on. And, and nobody wants to be in that kind of a cycle. But yet, when it comes to family, it's pretty easy to let a lifetime go by and feel mistreated or threatened or at the butt of someone's jokes quite often and not really do anything about it because they're family and you don't want to cause, you know, family drama yourself. So if you are feeling like it's possible. This is a toxic sibling. What are you going to do about it? Let's talk about some things to look for. Are they totally, um, they love drama. They're always creating drama. They're always a victim in the stories that they tell. Somebody's always wronging them. Like they are the victim. Someone else is the villain. They're the victim. If they are someone who does that whole guilt trip on you for various reasons? If they are highly reactive, maybe they anger easily or they are um, defensive and you feel like you have to walk on eggshells around them, 
those are signs that they have some toxic behaviors. If you do not feel safe around them, if again, they make you the butt of their jokes or they just, their world is really all that they seem to care about. They don't listen or seem to care about you or your ideas or your life. And it's just a very one way street. So it can be exhausting and it is draining to be around a toxic sibling. And sometimes you might find that other people in your family enable it as well. And what I am here to do is call you out on enabling it anymore. And I, I don't mean to break up families or cause turmoil or up, upheaval. What I really mean to do is talk to you and tell you, you actually have options and you are worthy of really healthy, wonderful relationships everywhere you look around you. And sometimes this starts when it's closest to home. When you're little, you have to be with your sibling. You have no choice. As you grow up, things happen. Maybe you develop more of a feeling of commitment or a responsibility to them. It's a very clouded conception. It's a misconception. And just for your own well-being, try to look at it objectively while we have this conversation and then do what you want. This is your sibling. If you just choose to know everything about it and then understand they are not well, they're never going to be well, and these are the things that I'm actually going to do different now, then that enables you to stop um, really being a victim yourself. It's, you know, you stop pointing the finger at them and you just look at your part. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to choose to be and consistently show up as? Because you have a choice in that. So let's talk about some things that you can do in order to get through the holidays or any other family events. Now, stop normalizing their behavior. That is a huge thing families in general can do, but you do not have to be one of the family members that does that. Now, you don't have to laugh when they make jokes at your expense or someone else's if that's just a part of their kind of toxic behaviors like it's just pretty intense and uncomfortable but everybody makes it okay you don't have to continue to do that you can ask for clarity if they've offended you like what did you mean by that you don't have to make them feel comfortable for being uncomfortable now they typically, when there's a, a highly reactive or a toxic person um, you're dealing with, they really lack self-awareness. Or maybe what you're looking at is somebody that has just so much self-awareness. Again, the victim or always talking about like their world, like their part in things. And so it can show up in, in different ways, but that isn't totally, it's not a level of consciousness, it's not a level of self-awareness or self-actualization as we can talk about a lot in personal development. It's just another way for obsession, compulsion, addiction, lack of, of well-being for it to show up. Like So if somebody's really focused on themselves and you might think, well, they have a lot of self-awareness. That's not the kind of like self-awareness I'm talking about. I'm talking about how does my behaviors affect someone else? And what can I do to amend my behavior? That would be like the full cycle of self-awareness. And typically, if there's narcissism or personality disorders, or there's just, there's something that's unchecked, you're not gonna find self-awareness there. And so your job is to start to just identify that yes, this is a toxic person. I know what I'm dealing with now. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to, um, what's the word, like paint a pretty picture about it and then complain to my friends. Like I can just look at it and see it for what it is. In the moment, I don't have to kid myself or, um, you know, just kind of pretend anything. It's okay. Your reality also is 100% valid. 
And what happens when you kind of play the game, like everything's okay, this is normal. You're really like not being authentic yourself. And why is that okay? So the first thing is to own your part. And what you can do when you kind of see any of your characteristics, any of the traits that you might have making this behavior okay, then you can start to change it. And one of the things you can do is to start setting some boundaries. And there's a few ways in which you can do that. Now, when I have brought up boundaries in the past with clients and that subject comes up, it can feel a little confusing at first. Like what we think that means in whatever this hot topic is and what it actually can look like usually seems to be two different things and the way the the reality of a really true boundary setting is it's filled with love this is not about um co confrontational um or making someone feel bad about being who they are like setting boundaries there's a wonderful quote it's saying that i love me and you and this is how I have to do this at the same time. Like this is how I love me and how I love you at the same time. How I love me and you. So again, there's a pattern of putting someone else's needs before our own when they're the dysfunctional you know, part of the equation. But that in itself, like putting their needs first makes you part of the dysfunction. And it's setting boundaries. A lot of times we don't realize what other people are capable of. When we set a healthy boundary and we feel good about like coming to that on our own, like we've clearly done some work around it. We've done some writing. We're confident. We're setting a boundary that really works like for us. We're not doing it to make someone feel bad or to be mean or all of that. We feel comfortable with our, our decision. The, the mental clarity we have around the boundary, it's, um, it's really important to come from that place so that you can maintain it. And you know that it's not a way that you're, you're trying to set a boundary in the hopes that they might change, or you're trying to set a boundary to kind of put them in their place or whatever. It's not like that. And so the best way to get super clear on setting boundaries or if you decide to speak up to them at some point about their behavior, the very best way to ever get to that place is to do a lot of writing. I call it the work and there's some exercises I could give you to do. It's really important to make sure that there is no blame. There might be a lot of feelings and anger and sadness and guilt and just a lot of emotions involved. But the more writing you do and the more work you do around it, you free yourself of all the negative emotions and usually, ultimately, you find yourself in a place of love making a healthy decision. If you don't feel like you're coming from a place of love making a healthy decision, your work is not done yet. Your goal is to get to that place and you could do it messy. You don't have to get it perfect. You don't have to be in this, you know, visionary place of love and, and then act only from that. I mean, that's suggested, but you can do it messy. You're a human being too, but try to really do the work. So you let go of blame and anger and all the stuff that will live inside of you as well. So it's really important to do the work, which is writing and there's specific exercises to be done around this. So here's a list of boundary setting skills to use when you are around your toxic sibling. Let's talk about um, a few of these. Uh, stop people pleasing. Minimize the opportunities you have where there will be any contact. You don't have to sit right next to them in the living room or at the dining room table. You don't have to be physically near them. And when you're not physically near them, they're not having those opportunities to kind of bring you into their, you know, intensity or whatever it is that makes them toxic. Remember that no one can actually make you feel something. You feel certain ways because something happens 
it triggers a feeling that comes from how you perceived it. Something happens, it makes you think something about it, it means something, it means something about you, it means something about them, it causes these feelings because of what you interpret it. So the same thing could happen and after you've done all the work, it won't trigger you the same way. You'll have a different thought about it, like, huh, yep, that's about what I thought they might say. Or, yep, that's why I don't want them in my life anymore. Or, yep, that sure is interesting that they are still doing that thing. You know, it really takes a lot of the pain out of it when you've done the work around it. So remembering that no one has that power to make you feel something. Very important. You're responsible for your well-being. You can always walk away. You should definitely stop reacting to them because when you're a part of it, you're just adding fuel to that fire and you're actually like a big part of the problem. So stop reacting and stop expecting them to say or do things differently. Now, if you feel like you are ready to speak up and have a conversation, again, get super clear on what your needs are without any blame or finger pointing about what they're doing wrong or all the ways they've harmed you. This isn't, that's not the point of of speaking up or setting boundaries. It's really speaking about you for you. Like what are your needs? And when you really get clear on that, you can have conversations that you might not have been courageous enough to have before. You can make decisions differently. Just the simple act of doing the work, like the writing around it, it's sending messages to your subconscious that you're actually worth it to um, you're valuable enough to pay attention to this and how can you better take care of yourself. So it's really good even just that step of doing some writing, doing the work. So in many cases, when you come from a really clear place, it's, it's clean, there's no blame. Maybe you've spoken up and you said, I really don't like it when you make jokes at my expense. Oftentimes with semi-functioning families, a conversation is all that's required and maybe just one and then it's healed. Maybe the problem is fixed. Maybe moving forward, everything will be different. And maybe they won't be, you know, so defensive or there, there won't be such intensity around them. Maybe they'll just get it. And maybe you can move forward and laugh a little about the past without still, without being insensitive to this has been harmful to me and I never gave you the opportunity. I never told you, but now you've told them, so maybe moving forward, everything could be better. Now, I feel that speaking up, it is important. It gives someone an opportunity. It's a gift. And if you're coming from the right place, it's the only thing sometimes that has the power to truly change such a negative situation. What they do with that information is up to them. Their reactions and their behaviors are always just information. It's not you. It doesn't represent you. It doesn't speak about who you are or what it means about you. It's about them. If you're coming from a clear place with love and clearly saying what your needs might be or you're just trying some of these skills, just trust your instincts, trust your judgment because if they don't get it or they are who they are and they are not changing, maybe there is some past trauma or uh, alcoholism or um, some thing that they've gone through, but they haven't actually done any, they don't have the self-awareness or they've never chosen to go to counseling or they haven't done anything about it and they have some issues, but they're not dealing with them. As you get older, that stuff gets old. Like unless you're kind of, you know, um, really capable of dealing with that and it doesn't have, you know, an, an impact on your life, 
that can be really hard. And in extreme cases when maybe you're dealing with somebody that has some kind of mental illness or personality disorder or some, they're, you know, an active alcoholism or something, you could speak up and come from the best place. You could try this or that or do this or try things, you know, and just give it time and it will not change. They might not be capable of it. And I'm so sorry if that's the case. But that is important information for you. So in extreme cases where there's real, you know, toxic behaviors with some illness, some lack of recovery going on, and they do not change their behaviors or the way that they treat you, they continue to harm you or threaten you or mistreat you in some way, it's okay to cut contact with them. And if you look in the article, there's actually um, something someone sent me. It's um, like a little Pinterest thing, but it's like a quote from Daniel hope. Um, it's a really good one. If you read that, I couldn't believe how well it spoke to me like a year ago. And I eventually, I just cut ties and it was the best decision for me. And it's, um, it's still not easy, you guys. Like it is what it is. Some, when people are ill, they are going to continue to do things and you don't have control over someone else's behavior. And you do your best and you stay clear like you just keep feeling love like if you have to think back to your any childhood memories that actually bring you love so that you see them in love like you see them surrounded with light because the more anger or all the negative emotions that you harbor that's only going to have an effect on you so these are some ways to identify the toxic behavior to know how to better navigate it while you're actually with them or to eventually cut ties with them. And you can always go to counseling. If you think that might be an option, try counseling with the two of you together. And that's something that um, might work in some situations and really to be able to give your sibling the benefit of the doubt. So if you think that they might have gotten it, like you've talked about it, or maybe you've, you know, in one you know, or more situations, you've just asked for clarity when you feel that maybe you were offended or something happened. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Try to, you know, let go yourself. Let go of resentments. Let go of the pain or the harm that's been done before. Like if they actually seem like they care enough to try and they are amending their behavior, nobody's perfect. So give them the benefit of the doubt. And the last thing I'll say is if you are in a situation where you really feel like, hell no, I'm not speaking up because that my brother or my sister's head will spin around and stuff will come spewing out, like they would not handle that well. Like it's, it's not just that you don't have courage, that you're insecure, that you don't want to speak up for your needs, like that could be a part of it. But chances are your instincts are pretty dead on. Like you grew up with this person, you know their typical reactions, you know they probably could not handle an honest conversation about it. And that's okay too. You don't have to speak up. You don't have to actually do anything. You could just know what you're dealing with and either continue on at family gatherings, keeping your distance, we're just treating it a little differently with the skills that we talk about in the article and that I, some of them I mentioned here. But you always have choices. And if it's to cut contact, you can do that. If it's to try for something that I haven't mentioned, but knowing it's important to you that you have a relationship with your sibling, then do not give up. Then keep on going. It's a wonderful person in your life. If it's something that you truly value and you know, I really would love to see this work out. And you can kind of take away any ideas you have that might include expecting them to change in any way. Like if you just focus on how can I better navigate this and accept them and love them for who they are, 
you're going to do great. And that it's, it's usually a hundred percent always about you. And so just come back to what really works for you and trust it. Just trust it. So remember when you're kids, you do have to be together and very little choice in that. Maybe you even had to share a room. But as you grew up, maybe this, you know, these, you know, years have shown you, like, this is not good for me. I don't want to be around it. There's clearly, like, some stuff that's going on and it's not going to change. Here's the thing. You're not a kid anymore. You're an adult and you get to make decisions. You get to do things differently. And just remember, as you set boundaries, you're saying, this is how I love me and you at the same time, because you are so worth it. Thank you so much for watching. And please watch the video, um, uh, read the article. And there's a great self-esteem five-day challenge I've included in this article. So BeccaStar.com, you can go to the blog and find many articles on well-being and communication, relationships. And I hope this helped. Have a wonderful holiday season, and I'll see you soon.